everybody. And welcome to our uh, seminar looking at measuring progress and the launch of sustainable our sustainable progress index for 2019. Welcome especially uh, to those watching us uh, on our live cast. Uh, you're more than welcome uh, and we'd be glad for your engagement with, with us uh, throughout the day or throughout the morning while we're on. Uh, the story uh, of this particular piece of work goes back a long way. Uh, in 1995-96, which is a fair bit of time ago, we were um, getting worried ourselves about how progress was measured. And we decided that we would have our annual social policy conference in 1996 about the issue of progress and how it was actually measured. And we looked around extensively and came up with two economists that we thought would be able to come back and do a fairly good presentation measuring Ireland's progress. And those two were Professor Charles Clark and Dr. Uh, Catherine Kavanagh. Both of them still with us working on the same stuff today. Now, when we, pro we published our, the, the, the material that they had and they presented it at our social policy conference, to say that they got dog's abuse and that we got dog's abuse would be a serious understatement because the idea that progress was not being measured the correct way uh, was kind of serious heresy at that time. And there was huge negative response uh, to the idea that GDP was not the best way to measure progress. Now, for younger people today, this might seem crazy because we've, got, we've gotten the full gamut, if you like, from a situation where GDP was sort of accepted without question as the way to measure progress to a point where there's more or less universal acceptance of the fact that there's a problem with GDP and we need to go a different way. Fast forward to 2015 and we decided that we were going to take a much more serious and consistent look at the whole issue of uh, progress and how it was actually measured. Uh, in between, we had had the crash uh, ten, almost 10 years ago now. But um, in the years before that crash, we could say uh, that Charles Clark had actually over and over again told us that it was a serious global crash coming and spelt out why. And uh, I know in Ireland we had Morgan Kelly uh, almost on his own making this point, but we had actually got another source uh, and we were very impressed when the actual crash, crash came. Not with the crash, but the fact that Charlie had actually pr uh, predicted it and predicted it accurately as well. So uh, we asked them to actually start looking at uh, building the index and doing it on a, uh, an ongoing basis. Uh, to three years ago, we decided to start building it on the basis of the Sustainable Development Goals that the UN had signed off on on 2015, including Ireland being a big player in that. And from that has come the Sustainable Progress Index that we now update every year. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go into a great deal, lot of detail. Charles Clark is Professor of Economics and Finance at uh, the St. John's University in New York. Uh, Catherine Kavanagh uh, lectures in, in, uh, in economics in UCC and Cork, and they've worked together on these issues for the last, as I said, 25 years, and with some very good, good results. So without any more ado, I hand you over to Charlie. Oh, thank you, Sean. And uh, to give all credit where credit is due, uh, I'm not a macroeconomist, so my job generally isn't in forecasting. Uh, however, I watch the and pay attention to the Levy Institute studies, and they seem to be the most accurate. And in 2002, they had published a study which laid out uh, basic imbalances in the U.S. economy connected to uh, the financial sector. Uh, and I just taught that and went over it with my students. That and uh, they thought it might come a year earlier, but it's they were uh, fairly, very accurate uh, in terms of the housing bubble. Anyone who was buying a house figured that out. <laughs> okay, the uh, 
as Sean said, that in 96, we were, 95, we were asked to put together a way of measuring the economy that wasn't just GDP. Uh, and it was quite a challenge because often when we went to different government agencies to get the records, uh, they happened to be records that seemed to get uh, burnt in the post office during the Easter uprising or the customs house fire. Or, for some reason, it was very hard. Now, because someone invented the internet and things are much easier to come about. Uh, but the, there's, our general approach, and what's widely now called beyond GDP, uh, is to look at how the economy is being measured. Uh, but in this year's index, the opening part isn't so much on just how do we measure GDP, but on what is GDP measuring? And that is looking at economic growth as the be all and end all for economic policy. And is that the best way to promote uh, social well being and social progress? Uh, so it's not so much that it is GDP the best measure, but is the goal itself uh, the best way to approach uh, the issue? And the division of labor will be like most gender division of laborers. Uh, the man will do the flashy parts, and the substance will be handled by Catherine in terms of the index. <laughs> Okay, so just to give an overview, uh, what we're really interested in looking at is uh, how economists understand economic growth, why they have a narrow view of it, and how a broader view uh, will link uh, policy towards, towards social progress or improving people's lives or whatever your, the general goal is. Uh, and also, I think, would lead to more basic economic growth. That is a better way to approach the subject. Uh, but our, our, more of our interest is, is in the, just the overall concept. Well, I think I just went over that. Uh, so in the earlier work, we looked at what's wrong with GDP. I don't, I don't want to repeat too much of it. But in the Irish context, uh, it's not just what's wrong, it's what's completely wrong with GDP. Because uh, particularly in 2015, Ireland had a, a growth rate of just over 26%, which is basically impossible to have. Uh, and so that was a big flashing sign. Uh, but even when I was here in 95, 90, 94, 95, I taught at UCC, that's ca how Catherine and I started working together. I went to a conference in Dublin in which they were talking about some of the issues with GDP in Ireland. That because of the foreign sector, that the, what they're measuring is much more than what the actual activity is uh, in Ireland. And so even just a handful of companies, like Apple, they're booking all their profits in Ireland, just skews the overall numbers uh, in, for I Ireland's GDP, so that as a measure of how the economy is going, it really isn't all that accurate. But in a broader issue, uh, GDP is measuring just monetary transactions. And monetary transactions can be good, but they could also be not necessarily making us better, but defensive, like buying more locks for our houses or hiring more security guards for our schools. They might be important, but they're not making us better. It's, just it's more a defensive type purchase. Or we could be spending money on things that are harmful to people. And it still gets measured as part of GDP. Uh, there's a New York Times did a study, uh, uh, an article a long time ago in which, the guys, in which the writer pointed out that the best thing for GDP is a man going through divorce and cancer treatment at the same time. <laughs> in both cases, he's generating a lot of transactions. But can we say that he's really, his life is better uh, because of that. And so GDP is just really just measuring uh, economic activity, which could be, which is important, but as a proxy for this is how the society is doing, and also as the goal towards which policy should be geared towards, uh, there are some problems. And a lot of these problems became noticed when applied to the developing world. So in the 80s, there was a big push to try to generate economic growth in Africa and Latin America uh, using macroeconomic uh, models and policies which really were concentrated on balancing budgets so that these countries would cut their education and healthcare spending in order to 
have a better fiscal balance, which that would, then would attract foreign investors and create all this economic growth. Well, it didn't work. And in the, the 80s was some people call the lost decade of development. Standards of living and po poverty rates went up, standards of living went down. And it's, on hindsight, it's pretty easy to see that when you cut investing in people, people will be less productive. Uh, and so cutting education and healthcare spending is the worst thing you could do if you want to promote not just well-being, but just a healthy economy. Because the economy is always what people produce. Healthy, educated, motivated people will do much better than sick people or people who are alienated from the system or disconnected from it. And so switching towards more of a focus on how people can contribute uh, instead of just measuring monetary transaction uh, is, has become fairly mainstream. In fact, the UN did a study in which a couple of Nobel Prize winning economists uh, basically came to the conclusion that GDP is not a good measure of how the economy is doing or how, how social well-being of, of people in society, in society are doing. Okay, so the, the main impetus in developing GDP in the first place was during World War II, the United States and England wanted to be able to measure how much can we spend on the war. So they had to know, well, what is potential GDP? So John Maynard Keynes got his assistant, uh, Richard Stone, to start developing ways that we could measure the British economy, and there are a couple of people in America doing the same thing along Keynes' theory, and that became the national income systems that countries around the world use. Eventually, it was tied to measuring the standard of living, and then everything was, was thrown under the, uh, the goal of, of economic growth. So we'll get more social mobility, it's good for democracy, it reduces poverty, uh, it improves tolerance. My favorite was it reduces pollution, <laughs> which intuitively you would say, well, more economic activity probably generates more waste uh, but the argument is that concern for pollution in the environment is a luxury good. You know, poor people never worry about these things. Only upper class people who are now have the luxury to say, well, I'd like to have cleaner air and you know, I'm concerned about animals. And this is the attitude, particularly in the 80s and 90s when I was uh, in graduate school, when you were reading the economics of the environment literature, that if we raise everyone in the world to America's standard, they'll all be as concerned <laughs> as Americans are about pollution, and then they'll, be, they'll do something about it. So we just have to have everyone rich enough so that pollution is something that comes under their radar. Now, if you go to poor neighborhoods, they understand pollution very well. I mean, they understand the cancer rates they get, because all the pollution is, is in, in, their, in their area. Uh, that's where the, burn, the, the burn, burners are and the trash collection, et cetera. Uh, but the attitude of economists was, well, we just get, we have to get people to choose the environment. It's a choice, and it will come after food, rent, and all these other things. So if we just raise their standard of living, that they'll go out and buy environmental protection, then economic growth eventually will give us a cleaner environment. So this is the approach that economists we're taking to this. Uh, Benjamin Friedman is a very prominent uh, economist at Harvard. Uh, he's written The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth because there's been a reaction starting in the 90s uh, and 2000s, particularly by environmentalists, but also by other people who are working on uh, social justice issues, that economic growth isn't providing, uh, the, it isn't giving us the benefits that we were told. There's a famous article that the title was, if the economy is going up, why do I feel down? That prosperity was on paper, but people were not feeling that their lives were better. Particularly in, in the developed world, uh, it was very generational. You had generation after generation where the children could say, yeah, I'm doing better than my parents. And then all of a sudden, they weren't able to say that. But on paper, they had a lot more money but they were much more stressed. Uh, they, having two workers in the household caused problems because society didn't adjust to this new reality. And there were just all sorts of ways in which people now look back and say, you know, my parents' generation just had it much easier than we do now. Yet, 
We own so much more than they did. So for economists, every problem became a nail and economic growth became the hammer. It was the solution to everything. And uh, there's a wonderful book, in fact, my favorite book in economics, uh, by John Kenneth Galbraith, The Affluent Society in 1958-59, where he argued the bias towards economic growth as the main uh, policy goal, uh, that there's a great deal of self-interest in that. And that, well, this is what is very good for business, particularly big business. If the government is committed to ra raising the level of monetary transactions year after year, that makes it much easier for big businesses to be successful. It takes out the uncertainty uh, that they'll have customers when they invest to build more cars, more appliances, more of everything. Of course, now, if we look at economic growth historically, uh, the first push for economic growth really comes when we start to get nation states in this mercantilist period, 1600 to 1800, and their economic growth was seen as bringing gold uh, and treasure into your uh, country, state, province, whatever uh, the unit of, of government was. And this was typically through conquest. You know, you went out and conquered an area. Uh, for England, you went out and, and raided Spanish ships who had just raided Latin American shores for gold, and this gold came into England and helped us to start England's economic development. For a lot of countries, it was just the slave trade and the money that was made from that. So it wasn't so much a concern with raising standards of living. In fact, keeping people from buying things in your own country was an essential part of mercantilism. You wanted to export to get gold. And so how much gold you can accumulate, which was what the sovereign was interested in, uh, became the main policy and fighting all these wars over uh, areas to, to conquer and trading areas became an economic policy as much as a military policy. And so if you look at 1600 to 1800, that is basically the, the growth strategy, was you know, take over an area and take the resources away from the locals, if possible, enslave the locals to bring to another area. And that was the main growth strategy. John Maynard Keynes changed the focus to economic growth being not about how much gold and silver you could accumulate, but how the average person's standard of living is affected, and that that is affected by increasing their production. So if you can get people to produce more, then there'll be more goods and services with the standard being that the average person now has more goods through trading and specializing, you'll generate economic growth. And so economic growth became much more about production instead of about profits. Now, in 1776, in the Wealth of Nations, he wasn't worried about how do you measure it. Uh, there weren't you know, statistical agencies they, that would be measuring things like gross domestic product. But changing the attention to how do you increase people's productivity uh, it, it, was a, it was a big development. Uh, in the 20th century, it became much more about not so much increase in economic growth, that seemed to be taken care of itself through techno technological change, but how do we provide full employment? And how do you keep the economy near or close to full employment? And so we have the development of monetary and fiscal policy, particularly after World War II, as, 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 as the way that we create the most jobs so that we have basically a good chance of getting reelected. So governments were committed to a healthy economy. A healthy economy was growth in GDP and low unemployment rates and also controlling for inflation uh, if that became a problem. But the basic approach to economic growth is that economic growth is about capital accumulation. In fact, there are many books on the theory of capital accumulation. That's a book about economic growth. And the idea is that if we accumulate capital, have more wealth that we can then invest in machines and technology, then we will get economic growth. Now, in theory, this starts with savings. So we get people to save, that money can be lent to businesses, and then they can invest. 
Now, historically, countries that have grown have not grown relying on their savings. This is the benefit of going out and stealing other people's gold or stealing their land or stealing their people is that you can now invest without cutting your consumption. The, the money or the resources are coming from outside your economy. So in the early phases, savings wasn't all that important. And once you get to a fractional reserves monetary system, uh, you don't have to necessarily save before you invest. You just need unused resources, and you can create credit to get that to move into the economy. Uh, but still, the idea is one type of capital, finance capital, is what drives the system. If we have money that then can be invested, then the process runs. And so that so important is finance capital that when we call the economic system capitalism, uh, what we're saying is that our economy is run to the benefit of the owners of the finance capital. Uh, they are the special group. The wealth creators is the big phrase in America. Everyone else is a taker, but they're creators. And that having them invest their money uh, on, on the profit motive and not anything else is the best way to ensure that it will be used most productively and the industries will create the greatest profits and that will by itself create economic growth. Uh, so what we're challenging is this notion that there's only one asset uh, that leads to helping increase productivity. Uh, now in economics, they often confuse between what is finance capital and what is manufactured capital, between the stocks and the companies themselves. But basically, uh, it's the financial capital aspect that they are most interested in. But increasingly, particularly in the past 10, 15 years, even in the World Bank, uh, we have this broader understanding that capital is really just the assets that allow us to be productive. Uh, and it's not pieces of paper uh, alone, but it could, they have a broader measure. So we have the finance and manufactured capital, the tools that help us. But also looking at the natural resources as also a stock of capital that yields a return for society in different ways. And human capital, even earlier, uh, looking at training and education as an investment in people so that they can become more productive. So human capital is now seen more as part of this set of assets that allow us to be productive. Uh, and then this, in the last 10, 15 years or so, social capital, social institutions that encourage trust, that form a social bond, all these, all these relationships allow economies to work much more efficiently. You know, if I'm trading with someone and there's a trust involved, that means I don't have to spend resources to investigate. Can I trust this person as a supplier? Uh, do I have to investigate what they're selling me is going to be dangerous? You know, just being able to say, well, no, I can trust it, means my resources are going towards the exchange instead of to other things. In economics, we call this you're reducing the transaction costs. Uh, so international agencies are more and more understanding that social capital and the social institutions that allow us to do not only our economic activities, but our political, social, all life and community, uh, that this is critical to just successful societies. And uh, a lot of books came out in the past 10 years that the societies that do well are the ones that have invested in social capital and not just are raising money in their stock markets in order for their businesses to be able to buy new and better equipment. So looking at a broader view of what makes for a healthy and prosperous society, instead of just one component, uh, allows us to have a greater connection, I believe, to the goal of having an inclusive economy, having a sustainable economy, uh, and one that works best for people. And not just looking at, well, we're going to use the profit motive for finance capital, and if we allow that, uh, no regulation, a free market, that that will take care of everything else. Of course, the problem is that every time you deregulate finance, you eventually lead to a financial crisis. Because once you allow people complete freedom in how they regulate credit, fraud just you know, marches in there. Because 
it's just so obvious that uh, they can benefit from what is always a trust-based uncertain system. Uh, and so switching our attention to much more meaningful ways of promoting social development, social progress, uh, has been the move in the developed world, but also in the analysis in rich countries. Okay, and also, if you look at the main challenges in the 21st century, uh, inequality, technological unemployment, the environment, and financial instability, not only are all these interconnected with each other, but they're also, also interconnected with the focus of finance capital and what's profitable in that area being the sole or the primary public policy goal. You know, it's that that it tells us we need we needed in the late 90s and early 2000s to deregulate financial markets, to encourage outsourcing and globalization, basically to move towards the financialization uh, of the economy so that business decisions are made for what is best for that finance sector and ignoring all the other, all the other stakeholders. Uh, we have debates in business schools of the shareholder model uh, that is, should companies be run only for what is best for the shareholders? And the finance and economics, they, that is, it's not like that's an opinion, that's, a, that's like a natural fact, that's like gravity. You can't take that away because everything else doesn't make sense. Uh, however, that doesn't come, that doesn't produce the results because what you end up is these periodic financial crises so that you are not having this smooth increase in standards of living. Instead, what you have is stagnant standard of living, but a bigger share going to finance. You know, if you look at the United States, most of the growth of the economy has really gone to three sectors in the economy over the past 30 years. 30 years. The tech sector, and we can see that, they've invented a lot of new things. Uh, the lobbying sector, uh, which is also easily to explain, but the main shift has been towards uh, to finance. They get a much larger share of the economy. They get much 40% of corporate profits uh, right before the crash, whereas before they were averaging 10% for years and years and years. They just, ca they, they figured out ways that they can capture a larger share of what, of the wealth in the economy. And that's because their sector, we have been led to believe that's the key to success. If we just give them the resources and stay out of their way, everyone will benefit. Okay, in the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of these alternative measures of economic progress. And so what we did is we looked at things that are doing something similar to what we're doing. And here we have this a social progress indicator uh, index, which is put out by Michael Porter uh, and many others. They have a lot of resources, a huge website. I think they track something like 87 different variables. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that if you look at the relationship between GDP and social, their measure of social progress, what you see is for low income, below 30,000, there's the, what we'd expect, that these societies, they need to produce more goods and services, and they, all other factors improve. But after 30,000, in fact, this is the first year where the trend line actually goes down. Every other year, it was basically flat. But that for countries, the rich countries, uh, just increasing GDP does not raise people's standard of living, does not make them feel like they're doing better. And there, now that we have many of these, we can see that uh, this is just a, a general trend. This is the first one to do this. Richard Easterling, uh, data from the early 60s, this came out in the early 70s, looking at how GDP affects happiness. And you see that it flattens out. One of the interesting things that Easterling's found is that, one, countries that are richer generally are, tend to be happier. This is when there are very, very few, there's only two countries that would be part of the developed world that are in this, in this study. But the other thing is that within a country, when you raise their, their per capita income, their level of happiness doesn't go up. Uh, and this is called the Easterling paradox. Well, this is, I was an undergraduate when we read this. So this is a very long time ago. But now there's a whole happiness literature and there's the World Happiness Survey. And here you can see the same effect. Under 30,000, increasing income, 
uh, is a factor, R squared of 0.43. Uh, so almost half of the increase in well-being, we could say, is statistically connected to raising GDP. But then no effect after that. So that something else is improving our well-being for the, for the rich countries. And they've done an analysis where they see that the, the basically they argue for rich countries, 26% of well-being is how GDP is doing or how the economy is doing. But all these other factors are things that we could affect directly instead of saying, well, we'll get the economy to grow and it will trickle down to social support. Governments will have more money or to life expectancy. We could afford a better health care system or we could be more generous because we have more money. Uh, but we can encourage those factors without having to worry about GDP directly. And that is what the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, are doing. Is they're looking specifically at these factors that improve people's lives instead of let's do something else and hope it trickles down to that. Now, we included this in the report from the happiness surveys just in terms of Ireland. And you see that. Uh, the black line, that certainly the financial crisis uh, made people less happy. But the interesting thing is what contributed to happiness during the crisis. The green line is generosity. So people appreciated uh, other people's gener generosity greatly when we were in the recession, uh, and that people's perception of corruption went up, particularly, uh, we respect that in Ireland since the financial crisis and the housing bubble and everything was tied towards a lot of fraudulent activity in the banks and loans, things like that. So we're, we're suggesting that instead of basically trickle-down economics, that is give all the money to the people at the top and hope that they'll take care of everyone else, that instead we're looking at causation as both ways, that if we improve these factors, that helps the economy, and not just let's help the economy and hope that it improves these factors. And that social well-being can be directly targeted, and we can break it down to different aspects. Uh, we can learn from what other countries uh, are doing. And in our study, we have the EU 15. Uh, and so we can compare how we're doing with how they're doing to see what are the possibilities that we can work on directly instead of, well, if we just grow the economy, everything will take care of itself. And I think that brings me up to, well, my day job is as a historian of economics, works on how our understanding of the human person influences economic theory. But in economics, a lot of the problems is that they define a human in the rational economic man so that if anyone, everyone only works in their own self-interest and they don't consider anyone else, that every other step in this story is natural. But if you look at people as being basically social and that their well-being is connected with the well-being of those they live with, which is actually Adam Smith's approach, then you would not take GDP is the only thing that matters and everything else trickles down. You would take a more comprehensive approach. OK, so Catherine will now take over with the index. Thank you, Charlie. Apologies. Technology, can't depend on it. Uh, so th thanks, Charlie, and um, welcome, everybody. And I'm very glad to be here. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Sustainable Development Index, a little bit of the empirical work that we did in the study. 
So, okay. so the uh, first thing I'd like to say is our starting point for our empirical analysis are the 17 SDGs. And we think this is important because these goals, as you know, are part of the 2015 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The goals have come into force in June 2016. And since then, there have been some attempts to estimate how countries are performing on the SDGs. And it's interesting to note as well that a lot of the important institutes like the Eurostat, the World Health Organization, uh, the UN, the OECD have actually committed to um, monitoring the SDGs, but they've also committed to collecting the data that's required by countries to ensure that they do try and achieve progress on the SDGs. So uh, the first thing we did was we took a look at what Eurostat produced in their report uh, quite recently. And they measured, uh, or they attempted to measure about 100 indicators they put together. Now, of these 100 indicators, they said about 45 of them were multi-purpose. So a lot of the indicators pop up in some of the other SDGs. Now, they didn't produce an index. So what they did was they produced a lot of information on the EU 28 countries. And then they gave a judgment on how they felt these countries were performing. And Overall, this is what they came up with. They suggested that there was somewhere between moderate progress and significant progress uh, on the SDGs across Europe. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. They said that progress alone on an index or on the SDG is not sufficient for the EU. So whilst you might be making progress, it doesn't necessarily mean that the achievement of the goal is actually going to be realized by 2030. So that was the EU. Most recently, <laughs> Uh, Jeffrey Sachs and his colleagues in the US um, have sort of, I suppose, are leading the way in this whole area of a monitoring of SDGs to some extent, uh, using a very different methodology to what we're doing. And they're trying to get some indication across all the UN countries. Now, here's the thing, of course, um, data availability precludes analysis of all the 193 countries that uh, signed up to the signed up to the UN uh, agenda. So what they did was they they produced this sort of um, a color ranking is the best way of describing it. Um, and as far as now, given that they tried to cover all of the in indicators, which amount to something like 230. So you have 17 goals, 169 targets, and something like 230 indicators. And so what they do is they try and put all of this together, and then come up with a dashboard where in increasingly order of significance, red is where the real problems are, down to orange, then yellow, and finally green. And by, by the way, green doesn't necessarily mean that the, um, the SDG has been realized. It just means that there has been some progress towards attainment. So moving on then, uh, we have tried to, I suppose, contribute to this body of work over the last couple of years. And so this is our third in a series of reports that focuses on Ireland in the EU context. So as far as the data is concerned, we focus on the EU 15. And the reason we focused on the EU 15 is because we think it's important to look at Ireland in the context of its peers. And the other 14 countries of the EU 15 are countries that are of similar level of economic development, similar level of income. So that is the reason why we say, well, let's compare how we're doing relative to countries that we should be there or thereabouts. Or, and more importantly, I suppose, um, and it has been noticed by the likes of Jeffrey Sachs and Michael Porter, if there is a significant divergence of performance on SDGs amongst a small group of countries that are fairly similar on income, well, that surely should be directing policy to say, well, you know, what's going on here? How can we do better? Why, why is it that some countries are doing much, much better um, than we are, even if they have a, some sort of a lower level of, of, of income. So hence the EU 15 decision. Then we use some rules to guide what data we're going to use. And some of these uh, rules are quite simple. The first, I suppose, is that it has to be relevant and applicable. What we mean by that is it has to be relevant to the OECD list of indicators. Now, the OECD list of indicators is quite, quite comprehensive. As I say, 230, that is our guiding Bible, if you like. So, Within that, then, we also looked at Eurostat, because Eurostat, as I say, produced a report uh, last year which attempts to look at the EU28. Different indicators, because their focus is on EU, EU policies, and EU initiatives. 
So going back to relevance, as far as we're concerned, it's important that the data is directly relevant to the EU indicator set, or more importantly, the UN indicator set, um, if possible. So we try to align ours to that. Quality, we use only official published data. So hence, other data that might be available, it has to be available uh, in a published f format. So it's the OECD, Eurostat, World Health Organization, UN. And then from some non-official sources, such as Transparency International, or Gallup. Coverage in our, set, or in our indicator set, it's important that we have data for all of the 15 countries, otherwise we think we're not being, we're not being robust enough. And the final thing is it has to be the most recent year available. Some data, some data that is particularly coming from survey type of analysis, um, dates back to 2010 or 2011. We really feel that that's not the most appropriate way to be analysing how we're performing in 2019. So as far as possible, we try to use the most recent data available. So as I say, lots of various different sources. Now, problem, of course, nothing is ever that simple. We did run into some problems. Um, We've tried to develop for, uh, and move on from what we did last year, but still there is unequal coverage amongst the goals. Now what that means is that for some of the goals, some of the 17 goals, we might have three or four indicators. For one, indica for one SDG in particular, SDG 3, which is health and well-being, I think we have eight or nine indicators. But for two in particular, SDG 1 and SDG 17, we only have one indicator. And the reason for that is because, as I say, we use only official published uh, data. But also, because we're focusing on the EU 15, we think it's important that some of the indicators that are more relevant to the less developed countries, such as, for example, the extent of stunting amongst children, um, the uh, level of, of malnourishment. Um, now, that said, we did include an indicator which we felt was very important under the second SDG, SDG no, Hun no Hunger Malnutrition, which is obesity. And obesity is important because it's one of those um, key issues that is leading to an awful lot of problems, not just for the individual, but for the resources on the healthcare system. So obesity is in there. Um, so, so, you know, not, having just one indicator per SDG is not ideal, but we do envisage that as more indicators come on stream over the next few years, those sort of problems will hopefully be, be somewhat less, less important anyway. So for that reason, what we're doing this year is clearly not directly comparable to our reports in earlier years. Each year we're adding to the indicator set, we're changing them as more data becomes available, we're dropping some, we're including others, and of course all of this process is benefiting from consultation and from our discussions with other, other interested parties. Okay, so moving on then, as I say, as, when it comes to what we actually did with the index, I suppose uh, the first thing we note uh, and what's important is that the 17 SDGs um, are, as I say, based on the sustainable development agenda. And, you know, the EU, the uh, UN have clearly said that the social, environmental, and economic dimensions are important and they are captured by the 17 goals. We still think, though, it was interesting and informative to try and cluster those goals according to those three dimensions economic goals, social goals, and environmental goals. And that's exactly what we did. So, moving on, what the first thing we had to do then was, um, because all of this data is very heterogeneous, it, you, it, it deals with everything from policy outcomes, mm -hmm. such as mortality rates and um, you know, levels of d d disease, deaths, suicide rates, to policy means, such as you know, the percent of overseas development aid. So lots of different kind of data. The first thing we had to do was what we call normalize the data, rescale it. And the way we did that was, in the first instance, we applied what was called a percentile rank to each indicator. And the way that this works is that each indicator is ranked in order of good performance from zero to 100. So the indicator that performs best, or the, the best performing country gets a value of 100, and the worst gets a value of zero. Um, we do this for every indicator, and it, it's makes interpretation much easier because you can then readily see across all of the different types of data how each country is performing. The next thing I suppose to bear in mind is that each indicator in each goal is weighted equally. And across the goals, each goal is weighted equally. And the reason that we did that, now we did think about different weights, can be very, very subjective. We could have gone down the route of doing mathematical weights. 
Um, we could have you know, taken expert perhaps advice, but there is no consensus. And equally important, I suppose, is the fact that the UN has clearly said that all of the goals are integrated and indivisible. So we didn't feel that weighting goals within the whole composite measure was a good way to proceed. So equal importance to each indicator and equal importance to each goal. And as I say, following from the fact that, you know, to mess around with that, you would be looking at putting some indicators into other goals. Now, that's clearly not what the, uh, the goals were designed to do. So we then, as I say, looked at the three different um, levels of dimension, economy, society and environment. And finally, then we're going to present some information on, on our composite sustainable development index. And within all of this, what matters is how is Ireland ranked relative to the, to the EU countries. So first up, then, we have the economy index. Now, our economy index uh, includes two goals, SDG 8 and SDG 9. And kind of not surprising, um, as far as the economy is concerned, the indicators that capture GDP per capita and the unemployment rates, we score quite highly on those, really within the top of the, 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 the list. Um, however, within the um, SDG 8, we include a measure of decent work, because it's specifically one of the goals, it's specifically one of the indicators in the SDG 8. Now, our measure of decent work, there is no agreed consensus on what decent work is. We use the proportion of low paid workers. Now, Ireland's score is particularly poor on that. At about 22.5% of all workers, and these are all full time employees, are categorised as low paid workers. So that lowers the score of the SDG. Uh, SDG 8. Also included in it, SDG 8 is the NEAT indicator. This is not in education, employment or training amongst young people. And we don't score as highly on that. So overall, the score on the SDG 8 is 9. But the economy index also includes um, the measure of SDG 9, which is um, research and development, innovation and so on. And within that, we score again poorly on the percent of uh, R&D um, of out of GDP that is, is spent on, on R&D. Um, we're somewhere around 1%, which is clearly much, much less than the, than the 3% of GDP that has been um, suggested uh, by EU. Um, so overall, our economy index ranks Ireland at number 11. So 11 out of the 15 countries for the economy index. Moving on then to this, the social progress, or the, the society index, and this really captures sort of social progress. There's a lot of goals that are in here uh, that try and capture this dimension. Now, number one, of course, is the SDG 1, which is no poverty. And according to the Eurostat, Ireland has about 15.6% of its population at risk of income poverty after social transfers, um, which is just very slightly below the EU average, what our indicator, now we've only one indicator for this goal, and that indicator is the share of the population whose incomes fall below half the median disposable income from the entire population. And on that goal, Ireland comes in at number seven out of the 15. Then moving on to the second uh, goal, which is no hunger, as I said, obesity is in there. There's also um, a couple of indicators that try and capture sustainable agriculture. Now, we do well on one of these, which is the cereal yield, the, the efficiency of cereal yield, less well on things like the emissions. So overall, um, the score on the uh, SDG 2 comes in at 10 out of the 15. Now, as I said, there's quite a few goals here. SDG 3 is the well-being and health. And there's a lot of indicators trying to capture this, including things like alcohol consumption, um, smoking prevalence, um, suicide rates, life expectancy. There's an indicator in there that tries to capture unmet needs of the health system. Overall, Ireland comes out at nine, nine out of the 15 for that, indi uh, for that SDG. Moving on to four, four is where we perform well. This is our education, quality education goal. And Ireland does very well on things such as the proportion of the population uh, with a territory, territory level education. We do well on the PISA scores. We also do well on things such as the employment of our graduates. So on SDG4, Ireland comes in ranking at number two out of the 15. Number five uh, captures gender equality. And we use five indicators to capture that goal. 
and taking account of the fact that Ireland has a very low percentage of women represented at national parliament in senior management. We come in about 7 out of the 15 on gender pay. Overall, on SDG 5, Ireland is ranked 10th, 10 out of the 15. SDG 10 then is also included in the Society Index, and a combination of indicators there, there are four in total, we're coming in ranked 11, um, SDG 16, um, this is the goal that captures things such as peace, justice and strong institutions. There's a couple of indicators in there that try and capture the um, faith in the justice system, the level of crime, homicide rates and overall we don't do too badly on this goal. Ireland is regarded as a relatively safe place to live and the, the perception of crime is much lower than in other European countries. So we're coming in there um, ranking four out of the 15 countries. And then finally we come to, within this dimension, it's goal number 17. And again, because we've only published data, we've only one indicator to capture this, and that's the percent of income devoted towards overseas development aid. And Ireland, according to the most recent figures, uh, doesn't perform as well as we'd like on that, despite the most recent moves by the Ireland uh, and policymakers to um, up our level of of contribution towards ODA, we're ranked, uh, on that indicator, we're ranked 11th. So overall then, the Society Index gives us an overall ranking for this dimension of number 10, of 10th. So we're 10th in the, 10th in the list. Finally, we come to the environmental uh, trends and patterns and indicators. Um, now here, again, we have seven goals that capture this dimension. Um, so we've got things such as clean water, affordable energy, and clean energy, uh, responsible consumption, production, and climate change. Now, again, a mixed bag uh, in terms of the indicators that try and reflect the different goals. For clean water and sanitation, we use measures that we didn't use previously. They're more up to date. Uh, on that goal, we're coming in at five out of the 15. For SDG 7, we're not doing well. We're in the lower uh, rankings of the list. We come in at 12 out of the 15. And that's essentially because we have very high emissions, GH, uh, greenhouse gas emissions relative to the other countries. We use a couple of indicators, chiefly CO2 emissions per capita and uh, another indicator that tries to measure the CO2, um, the efficiency of CO2. Um, finally then, uh, sustainable cities and communities. A um, couple of indicators there that try to capture things such as transport and air pollution. We do quite well on that. Overall, though, however, we're midway in the rankings, but ranked number eight. Uh, SDG 12, again, is one of those where we don't fare too well. This is responsible consumption and production. Essentially, as far as this index is, or this goal is concerned, we're producing more waste. We are not recycling our waste as well as other countries, and we're not recycling our wastewater as efficiently as other countries. So overall, we do quite poorly on that, uh, on that goal, and we're ranked 14 out of the 15 on that goal. Uh, climate action, we're coming in 10 out of the 15 countries. Very hard to capture the required indicators, everything from climate mitigation to climate action. So there's a couple of indicators in there that try and kind of capture overall what we're, um, what we're measuring. And we come in at, as I say, number 10 out of the 15 on, that, on the climate action goal. Life below water and life on land. Uh, life below water, again, this tries to capture how we're doing in the protection of our oceans. Um, couple, it's been very difficult to get good, adequate data on this index, on this goal over the last couple of years. Uh, we rely on the Ocean Health Index and BirdLife International to try and capture the key elements and to reflect the, the theme of this SDG. Ireland is ranked 9 out of the 13 for that uh, SDG. And for SDG 15, we are ranked number eight. We're ranked at, uh, in eighth place. Um, we don't fare too well there, for example, on things such as the um, percent of forestry cover. We're ranked um, about, we've only just below 11%, which is well below the EU average on, on that indicator. So overall then, our environmental index puts Ireland in 13th place. So we have, I suppose, given a scale of the challenge that Ireland faces under the three dimensions of economy, society and environment, 
Our next step, as I say, is to produce an overall composite measure. And we think this is important because the benefit of having an overall aggregate composite measure is that it's easy to interpret and it's easy to, to convey what the key message is. And I suppose the key message from our analysis is that Ireland is ranked 11 out of the 15 now, out of, you know, across all of the 17 goals. So on average, we certainly believe that there is scope for improvement. We certainly think Ireland can do better, and it is our belief that we should do better. There's considerable spo scope for improvement uh, across all of the SDGs. But Ireland is not alone in that. Even the countries that are performing quite well on some indicators are not doing well on others. So it really is a question of all countries face different challenges when it comes to the SDG. As far as we're concerned, what's very important is that, that we continue to monitor them. What we have done is we've really, I suppose, presented a, a kind of a record, I suppose, um, a sort of a scorecard as to how we're doing. And in 2019, as I say, our analysis suggests that Ireland is ranked 11th out of the 15 countries. Pass you over to Charlie now, who's going to wrap up with a few policy considerations. Okay, I had thought about actually starting with this. Uh, in 1930, you know, right during the Great Depression, John Maynard Keynes, who gave us the Keynesian economics that has been running macro, micro, macro and uh, fiscal and monetary policy uh, since the 1940s, wrote a curious uh, article called The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren, in which he first starts off by pointing out that this current depression is just a temporary thing. That if you look over the long run, we've been having a lot of progress. And he argues that by the time in our grandchildren, so in a few generations, or as he puts it, in 100 years, we should have solved the economic problem. And that all our efforts to support capital accumulation can now be switched to improving people's lives. Uh, and one of the things that he focuses on is that when the, this is a quote, when the accumulation is no longer of such high social importance, there will be great changes in our moral codes. That things that, he says that we look at almost as semi-criminal, but this emphasis on what is good for finance, the profit motive, that we can now discard these. And he said we could pass them on with a shudder to those who specialize in, in mental disease. <laughs> that the love of money or the pursuit of profit as its own goal instead of as a means to higher goals is not what humans were put here for. It's, it's not what brings human fulfillment. But he says, you know, right now it's very important because we have to solve the economic problem. But once we've solved the economic problem, it's once we've been able to adequately feed, clothe, and house everyone so that they all, ha everybody uh, has a decent standard, material standard of living, then we can look at other things, such as are they social, is there social uh, mobility or integration? Are people able to pursue uh, their passions in terms of the arts and other ways that you can devote your lives instead of, as Keynes later on in the essay says, you know, tyrannizing over your bank account as your primary uh, activity. Uh, and it's interesting that Many of Keynes' uh, predictions came true. This one certainly hasn't. You know, so in terms of our material standard of living today, and we're getting close to 2030 when uh, it's 100 years after Keynes wrote this essay, uh, that the amount of material things that we own compared to our grandparents uh, is just, you know, it's a huge factor increase, one that our grandparents would have had a hard time understanding, even forgetting that, the technology that we walk around with little things and talk to people all over the world and just the te technological marvels that we've had. But just the, in ter terms of material cre uh, comforts, uh, we have solved what economists from Adam Smith on have, have said, the, the primary goal is how do we provide for the material reproduction of society. This is no longer a difficult thing to do. 
we have more people, as Catherine pointed out, more, we have more of a problem with obesity than we have with malnutrition. So that uh, we need to, he says, we need to look at not only different goals, but a different morality that fits that. And so uh, we're arguing that what the SDGs are doing is also making that step, saying that we need to, to look at the broader picture. Uh, and even, not just for rich countries, for developing countries, that this is a more successful way for them to, uh, to achieve uh, a higher level of development and, and uh, to promote the well-being of their citizens is not to just look at what makes the economy grow, but what helps society to grow. How do we in increase social inclusion? Okay, so from this we get a list of policy conclusions, many of which are designed to, to support a broader look at how society is doing as a way of informing public policy. So our approach isn't so much to come up with an alternative to GDP, one number, and we'll only judge government's performance based on that one number. It's more of a way to how do we get to where the rubber hits the road? How do we get to, we look at, we have an economy, uh, environment index, but that is designed to bring us to not only the individual SDGs, but the individual indicators, and getting down to where people's lives are and looking, well, how is Ireland doing on these specific statistic, uh, and how can we learn from how other countries are doing? One really stark example is uh, Ireland's carbon output, which 13 of the 15 countries since 2006 to the 2017, they've had declining per capita carbon output. Uh, Luxembourg has gone up by 0.4%, so it's a very small increase. Ireland has grown by 15%. You know, so most countries have dropped by 20% and Ireland is growing. So that some countries have figured out how can we grow the economy using less carbon that's a public policy decision. I mean, rules have been set to incentivize that type of behavior. Uh, prices have been adjusted so that individual businesses will make decisions that will lead to those results. And the countries that have done that have had greater success, uh, and Ireland hasn't been having those type of policies. And so the goal is for each of the indicators that we can then look at countries that are similar and see, well, they've perform, performed better. What are they doing that's different from what we're, we're doing? And in the areas where Ireland does well, they should be doing the opposite. Well, Ireland does very well in their education system. Uh, the United States should, could learn from it considerably. You know, how could we uh, be able to, other countries be able to achieve those results? But to do this, we need to have not just ideologies or a different way of understanding human, the human person, we need to have indicators so that we can have evidence-based policymaking. So we need to have uh, much more attention placed on collecting the data uh, so that citizens and policymakers can uh, be informed uh, and make their voices known. So a lot of our, our suggestions in terms of how do we sort of build out the apparatus that you need to have public policy uh, driven uh, and informed by the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and we see countries start to do it. I spend a lot of time, not a lot, but I spend some time every year at the United Nations, particularly at the Statistical Commissions, uh, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, and considerable effort is being placed in understanding all the data that we collect in terms of how it informs the Sustainable Development Goal uh, agenda. Uh, so it's really became, becoming a way to frame and understand all these issues. Okay, okay. so we're going to stop there. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and I think now we're going to have a Q&A time. There is another slide of proposals that I think people just should see, you know? That, that is the second. That is the second. Yeah. That's fine. Okay.
So thanks to, to Charlie and thanks to, to Catherine for presenting a very complex and uh, uh, intense kind of uh, uh, study, if you like, and very informative in the time frame that we have. We have a, a few minutes to go uh, before we take a break uh, for coffee or whatever uh, for Q&A. Just to say, I should have said at the beginning that the hashtag for today is, is hashtag measuring progress. Uh, but the fact that I didn't announce it doesn't seem to have made that big a problem as it's been trending in Dublin for the last hour. So we've got a lot of uh, very good uh, support in terms not just here, but obviously people watching as well who are uh, tweeting on, the, on the, uh, the hashtag. So for others, you might uh, go aboard there and tweet some of the stuff or retweet some of the stuff that's there if you wish. Um, one, there's a, a, a microphone here just to speak out when uh, you get it, uh, because the microphone is for uh, people who are actually watching online. Uh, it's not for amplification within the room here, so you have to speak out to be heard in the room. But uh, we'll take a number of questions together. Then we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll have a response from, from Jennifer. And uh, we will then have a much uh, a longer Q&A, uh, uh, which we can go back over uh, questions that arise here. So for the next few minutes, questions. Anybody has questions or observations or comments to make or whatever? OK, this one. And we'll come to you next. OK. You, you might, uh, people might uh, just identify themselves. Yeah, OK. No people with the, all the countries who are at the bottom of the list, they're all the countries that went through the worst part of the crisis. Okay, and I think that, that has to be noticed as well. And again, I suppose noticing where we are in that list is interesting. Um, uh, coming out of a crisis, um, there was a real rush to return back, and I think our 20% increase in carbon emissions uh, it's where you measure it for that makes a big difference in terms of where we've come from. doesn't mean that it's not a crisis. It doesn't mean that it's not a problem. But I think there's a rationale. I think one of the key pits coming out of this is how we reorganize our government to actually recover is probably not fit for purpose to actually address the next stage of this problem. Um, and I'm taken back with your Keynes article that I read some time back. And, um, he did predict quite a lot of things in terms of a future, but I think anybody who looks to 100 years ahead has got a problem in prediction, and most of us can't predict tomorrow's weather. Never mind anything else. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I just, um, I suppose just some very quick questions. Um, some very, oh, my name is Claire. I work in the environment sector, and I'm a former public servant that I uh, was put out of a job by public sector reforms. So that's one of my points. When you're looking at unemployment statistics, did you look at emigration rates? Um, because you know, if people are leaving the country due to unemployment, um, if you're only looking at the current residing population, um, maybe that wouldn't reflect the fact that people have actually emigrated to seek employment. So that was one, uh, one point and one question I had. I formally did that myself and returned to Ireland. And my brother is currently in that situation. He's emigrated to seek employment. Um, and my second question, I suppose, was around the environment indexes in terms of, say, forestry being an example. Would you look at forestry cover in terms of types of forestry or, you know, say, quilter plantations, for example? Um, or would you look at native, native woodlands? Like how, how did you kind of differentiate? And in terms of emissions, did you look at just co uh, CO2 emissions or would you have looked at a wider range of g uh, greenhouse gas emissions or other types of emissions? And just maybe to elaborate on some of those. Thanks. Appreciate that. Anybody else? We'll take another one or two. Okay. Hi, my, my name is Brian McDonnell. Um, I just uh, had a question on methodology. Uh, like I had understood the SDGs as a group of indicators that come together so we can compare progress across the world. So I'm not sure then why organizations like ourselves and Jeffrey Sachs and Eurostat and all the others are selecting certain indicators. Uh, so can you just explain that, please? Anything else? We take another one down the corner there. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Janet. I'm representing Senator Alice Mary Higgins. Um, so, just a question on the gender equality measurement. Um, firstly, which was just um, it, the indicators seem to be arranged like women in politics and women 
at board level? Are we capturing kind of gender equality not at the kind of top level at all? Um, and how how are we measuring that? So kind of women's experience of deprivation or maybe um, a disproportionate um, representation in low wage jobs and those kind of things. Is that been measured as well? And then a second one is just on um, sustainable cities. So I, I'm just one was wondering if we just tried the indicators there a little bit more. So the air pollution was noted. My understanding is Dublin has very low air pollution levels because it's a windy city and the wind takes away all the air pollution. So are we able to kind of capture that idea of like particularly in air pollution, like what's produced rather than just what remains in the city then as well? So maybe they're very precise questions. Listen, I think we've got quite a number there for quick. So who wants to take this issue that we've taken from the top down? Uh, the, con the countries at the bottom that were hit by the crisis. Which she wants to take this. You take it? Sure. Uh, yeah, our first study was uh, in '96, uh, which was before the crisis. But the, then we were it's, then we measured only Ireland, comparing Ireland with its past. Uh, yeah, if you looked at GDP, you know Ireland not only recovered from the crisis, but is the second richest country in this group. Uh, so what we're arguing is this is probably where, I mean, before the crisis, you had the four countries were the concern for Europe in the, in the 90s. That's where the money was going. So we're not surprised that this is much more long term. And in, in an exercise like this, you wouldn't expect much change year after year. I mean, this, this is at a, a glacier pace in terms of how society has changed because so many things uh, are adjusting, and the other and some are just the general trend of things, so that will affect all 15 countries the same. So really, what you have to do is close the gap between how you're doing and and the other countries. And you know, the, the for the European Union and the eurozone to be a successful uh, experiment, uh, there has to be convergence. Uh, you know, I live in a country that has 50 independent states. Uh, and convergence works by uh, rich countries paying tax, rich states paying taxes to a national government and then redistributes the money to the poor states. And those poor states then up voting for people who are against all the programs that they benefit from, but that's just a, an American thing that's hard to understand. Uh, so we're not surprised with the listing uh, that they would be on the bottom. Uh, it's, I think that's where we'd expect them to be. Okay. Question on immigration rates. Uh, yeah, we. Um, I suppose the first thing to note, as I said, is we we stick quite closely and try and align what our indicators are in our in our index with the OECD, with the sorry, the UN, so the official list, list of indicators, and that that means that it's it's GDP per capita, it's adjusted GDP growth, um, it's um, unemployment rates. Uh, I think Eurostat actually look at the long-term unemployment rate. But as far as immigration is, is concerned, no, that's not in there. What is in there, though, are attempts, and I'm just thinking this is kind of related to the gender equality issue. Um, th like, there is no measure, for example, of decent work. There is a measure of um, female labor force participation, female uh, employment rates. Um, there's gender equality. Pay, uh, Pay, uh, gender pay is, is an indicator in there, but you're absolutely right. There, there, there isn't any attempt to, for example, look at decent work um, by gender, for example. And that's something that could possibly be done in the future, absolutely, to, to reflect you know, um, perhaps people who are trapped in genders that are maybe tra trapped in certain types of occupations or part-time work or something like that. So absolutely, that could be expanded on. But at the moment, um, it's just the female representation in national parliament at senior management level, um, the employment, the, the female employment ratio, female labour participation rate, they, those are the indicators that capture gender. Mm -hmm. And as I say, um, the immigration is not in there. As far as the forestry is concerned, absolutely. I mean, we just have, it's, the, it's, it's just an aggregate measure that we get again from the official uh, published data, which is the OECD in this case, the amount of forestry under the, um, the, the, the percent, the overall share, under under forestry, um, and similarly, I think there was an issue there about air pollution. Again, it's again it's it's the official um, particles 2.5 p.m. And you're right. I mean, 
you know, Ireland fares critically kind of well on that indicator, but it doesn't do as well on the, for example, the transport indicator. But um, so, you know, we are, I suppose, kind of constrained to some extent about what the UN indicator list is, what data is available, and what data we can get at EU level as well. Part of the, the, the challenge of doing something of this nature, uh, which we came across when we were sort of putting it together originally and, and continue to do, is the fact that you, you are bound by the fact that you have to have get comparative data across the countries, otherwise you can't rank the countries. So uh, we sort of are tied, in, if you like, uh, with, uh, with that constraint, if you like. And there are, there are, there's quite a number of things that we'd like to measure that we think are important, but there aren't comparable measures on it. And in some cases, there's no measure at all. For example, what would Ireland's unemployment levels look like if we had, didn't have an immigration safety valve for the last 30, 40 years, like, or even longer. So th that's a question that's well worth taking a look at, but uh, it's, not, it's not something that we can put into this particular, particular uh, area. There's, um, there was one other issue about measurement itself, yeah? Sorry, you want can to I just jump in on the sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, actually in our, 96 study, um, migration was one of the factors that we looked at, uh, but we were only looking at, at yeah. Ireland. Uh, in terms of uh, statistics, in health and in education, the uh, statistics generated by international bodies is usually broken down uh, by gender as well. And I think in the, the last study before we adopted the SDGs, we had a, a male and female index so, so there's, I'd say about maybe half the data you can, uh, you can get data on male and female, uh, as well as by age. Uh, so in health and in education, I think it's probably easier because you have individual students, and individual uh, patients, I guess, that that data is increasingly becoming available that you can do that sort of analysis. Uh, but it, it interesting, in the SDGs, in the UN system, it became its own SDG, instead of being part of every single, uh, of all of them. And sometimes when that happens, then the attention switches, well, we have all the gender things in this box, we don't have to look at them in the other boxes. That, that's one of these limitations that we come across. Uh, now, I'm sure there's plenty more questions I can see people wanting, but we're going to take a break. Um, it's. We're going to take 30 minutes just for, particularly for people uh, following us on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on the live cast. We'll be back in 30 minutes uh, with a response uh, to, the, to this study, and then with more Q&A, we'll have plenty of time for, to wrap it up. Uh, so thanks for being with us, and uh, time for coffee, or tea, whatever. Thank you.